Chapter 40. Being president isn't easy. The small island of Cuba, near Florida, had terrible problems. Its government was corrupt. Criminals were making fortunes on the island, and most Cubans were very poor. So when Fidel Castro came along and took charge, in 1959, many Cubans and Americans were hopeful. But when they learned that Castro was a communist, a Marxist-Leninist, Soviet communist, most stopped cheering. Castro didn't clean up much of the corruption in Cuba. He also improved the schools and race relations, but he was a dictator. The Cuban people were not free to oppose him or his ideas. Many Cubans fled Cuba for the United States. They didn't intend to stay here. They wanted to go back to their country and overthrow Castro. Most Americans would have liked that. The idea of a communist nation with ties to Russia sitting 90 miles off the coast of the United States made people in this country very nervous. As soon as John F. Kennedy became president, he learned that the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, had been secretly training Cuban refugees as warriors and planning to land them on the island. The CIA experts said that the Cuban people would then rise up, join the invaders, and throw out dictator Castro. President Kennedy didn't want to seem soft on communism. After Joseph McCarthy, no one did. He told the CIA to go ahead. The invasion, at a place called the Bay of Pigs, was a fiasco, which means it was a flop, fizzle, bomb, washout, dud, botch, bungle, failure. Nothing worked right. The invaders were captured. The Cuban people didn't rise up. America and Kennedy looked foolish. The young president took all the blame himself. Around the world, people wondered, is he strong enough to be president? Russia's leader, Nikita Khrushchev, was sure he wasn't. It seemed a good time to believe the United States. Premier Khrushchev decided to do something bold. He decided to put nuclear missiles in Cuba. They would be aimed right at America's most important cities and military targets. Some missiles were already in place when spy planes flying over Cuba brought news that missile sites were being prepared. Then Russia's ships were sighted carrying more missiles. What, what should the president do? The wrong move could start World War III. Both Russia and the United States had weapons that could destroy the world as we know it. What would you do? The Joint Chiefs of, of Staff, our top military leaders, wanted to bomb Cuba. Kennedy said no to his. Experts. He would not drop the first bomb, but he did announce that American troops were ready to invade the island if the missiles were not removed. Khrushchev was in a tough spot, too. Khrushchev wanted the Russians to launch a missile at the United States. Khrushchev said no to that, but he did tell the Russian military experts in Cuba that they could use nuclear weapons if there was an invasion. Kennedy was firm. He said the missiles had to be removed. He gave Khrushchev time to make a decision. Secretly, Kennedy agreed to move, remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. Missiles were a threat to Russia. For 13 days, he, the world held its breath, wondering if there would be a nuclear war. Then the missile-carrying Russian ships turned around and sailed home. The Cuban missiles were removed. The crisis was over. Everyone knew that no one could win a nuclear war. Kennedy wanted both Russia and the United States to sign a treaty to stop testing nuclear bombs. We began talking with Russia about disarmament, reducing or doing away with weapons. Then, suddenly, Russia announced that bomb tests would begin again. Those tests put radioactive particles into the atmosphere and that poisoned the air. Kennedy appealed to the United Nations, but Russia's tests continued. Finally, Kennedy said that the United States would have to begin testing again. Then he made a great speech at American University in Washington. The president said that we needed to change our thinking about the Soviet Union. He said we needed to work together, not continue as enemies. Some Americans couldn't imagine getting along with Russia. Kennedy spoke to them. Some say it is useless to speak of world peace. I realize that the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as pursuit of war, but we have no more urgent task. We all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we all are mortal. A few weeks later, Khrushchev accepted the U.S. proposal for a test ban treaty. This treaty is particularly for our children and grandchildren, said Kennedy, and they have no lobby in Washington. Meanwhile, things were still a mess in Vietnam. Remember, governments in the North and South were fighting for power. North Vietnam was backed by Communist China and Communist Russia. We were sending aid to South Vietnam. The North seemed to be winning. President Kennedy sent his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, on a fact-finding trip. When Johnson returned, he said the same thing that almost all our military and State Department experts were saying. If we wanted to see the communists defeated, we would have to send more money and more supplies and more experts to train the South Vietnamese. So JFK sent the first American troops, called advisors, to Vietnam. Except for a few lonely dissenters, no one asked if it was right to fight communists in Vietnam. 
Just about everyone in the early 1960s seemed to think we had to. By 1963, we had 11,000 military advisors in Vietnam. We were spending a million and a half dollars a day supporting that war. Meanwhile, the struggle for civil rights continued in the American South. 